So welcome and thank you so much to all of you that are joining us today. Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today we are talking about hiring for executive and vice president roles with Emily Chavez. Emily is the founder and CEO of Joyful Jobs and we will get into the nitty gritty with Emily on this topic here shortly. If you haven't met us yet, Julia Patrick is here, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and we also want to thank our sponsors that keep this conversation like the one we're having having today with Emily going strong. So thank you to Bloomerang, to the American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, the Nonprofit Atlas, the Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as Staffing Boutique. So thank you to our sponsors. Please do check them out. Not quite yet, but as soon as, you know, 29 minutes from now would be a good time for you to, to check out our sponsors. So if you have not heard, you can find all of these episodes also on these various channels. So Roku, YouTube, I tried to put RoTube together, but that's not a thing yet. Um, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. And then of course, we're now streaming on all of your podcasts. So listen to the nonprofit show wherever you stream your podcast. So if you are not sitting down and watching this video component, you can just listen to us as you're exercising or traveling or, or what have you. So please do check out these episodes there as well. And back to our guest, Emily, welcome. And thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Jarrett. Thank you, Julia. I'm very excited. Yeah, seen some great episodes of your show. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be a guest. Yeah. You know, Emily, I love the name of your, your company. Thanks. And I have to say, we in the nonprofit sector, we don't always put joy and jobs <laughs> together. Right, talk especially these days. <laughs> yeah, so talk to us about like, how you came up with this. And actually, before we start peppering you with questions, like what joyful jobs, what you do and how you help the marketplace? Yeah, sure. So um, joyful jobs is essentially a recruiting agency. So I help primarily nonprofits as well as small to medium businesses with their hiring needs. So Usually what that looks like is an organization has a certain role that they need to fill. And I help out with that, um, with sourcing candidates, with screening them, um, and just presenting the best pre-qualified candidates for their particular role. Um, but then I also have some additional services available, uh, whether it be a need for like a chief fractional talent officer to help supervise recruiters or um, one of the things that, you know, as, as things modernize more and more with technology, um, I'm encouraging all of my clients to look at getting an applicant tracking system if they don't have one yet. You know, the days of submitting an application via email should be behind us. Um, so helping with things like that or um, consulting, even just yesterday, I did a, a training for a client on how to do effective interviews. So I have a variety of services available within talent acquisition. It is so needed. And those plethora of services that you just shared, so grateful to have that in particular for the nonprofit sector. And that's exactly what we want to talk about today. Uh, for those of you that joined us in our green room chatter, we talked a little bit and scratched the surface of our workforce. But Emily, let's dive into the deep end. And I would love to hear from you what our current status looks like in our market as it relates to the nonprofit talent acquisition. Definitely. Well, I think just about everybody at this point has heard of the term, the great resignation, right? If you're on LinkedIn, there's um, so much just chatter about that. And um, I think that at the bottom of all that is there's a heavier focus now on, uh, you know, throughout the pandemic, everyone is realizing what was really important to them. And um, a big part of that has been toxic workforces and toxic cultures. So I think that that's really the reason behind a lot of people changing jobs at this time um, as they're reevaluating their life priorities. Um, so I guess as far as nonprofits go, you know, in some ways, nonprofits already have an edge 
because most of your employees are, are mission driven. They want to be with your organization because of what you do. So in that regard, there is some somewhat less competition, I guess. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, I, I think it, you still have to be very competitive and forward thinking and modernizing some of your internal culture. So um, right now, well, it always has been, but diversity and inclusion is more and more a focus for a lot of employees, what, what the inclusive workforce looks like at a company, um, opportunities for growth, especially as we have, you know, we were talking before this about uh, baby boomers are retiring and Gen Z is entering the workforce and they're young in their career and they want opportunity to advance. So that is also huge is your culture, your workforce. Um, your organization promoting opportunities for that and offering your employees ways to grow professionally. Um, yeah, and then I guess another factor that can be difficult for, for nonprofits is, are you able to offer a remote option or a hybrid option or a flexible schedule even? Because a lot of times that is a priority for a job seeker right now. Um, and they may be able to get that at other organizations. So um, are you, what ways are you combating those challenges to, to stay competitive? Um, One of the things I'm thinking, Emily, and uh, <laughs> we mentioned this a, a little bit in our green room chatter is the inflation and that impact on the nation at large, but truly into the workforce. Um, and, you know, I, I saw a meme earlier today, I think it was, or yesterday, my days keep, you know, floating along um, of, you know, when gas prices hit $7, this is how I'm commuting to work, right? And it was like, basically, you're not going to work. So that remote viability is really key as we continue to change um, and navigate, you know, all of the changes that, that continue happening so how is the recruitment at this great resonation time point? How is recruitment looking? Is it bleak? Is it high? Is it happening? I mean, what does this look like? Yeah, um, well, it really depends on the role. I mean, I know that certain areas and certain roles are seeing candidate shortages. Um, great example, Jarrett, I know you're also in Arizona where I am. And you've probably noticed there is a shortage right now of like high level development uh, roles. So off development officers or fundraising professionals. So that is one area particularly that I've seen a lot of employers struggle. Um, but like we said, you know, if, if, if a organization can be willing to hire newer employees and train them up and, and really do a good job of retaining them, that is going to be key to, to keep your employees happy and to offer the growth opportunities and the flexibility that they're looking for so that you don't have to hire as frequently. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as if you wanted to, to get into a little bit more of what that looks like and finding employees um, these days, you know, you can't, there's the term post and pray. You can't just post and pray. Um, <laughs> I've never heard that term. That's, oh, that's yeah. a good one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Post and pray. <laughs> that says it all. Definitely. So that, you know, just refers to exactly what it sounds like posting on a traditional job site. And of course you still have to do that too, but nowadays you're, you're really needing to go do some active sourcing. And, and that's really what the term headhunting refers to is going out and finding your candidates. They may not be actively looking for a job, right. uh, but usually those are the best candidates. So you have to approach them and be, you know, get them to be open to a conversation with you as, as a recruiter. Wow. So with that, I mean, I always think of this as something that's very personality kind of almost charismatic, that it's driven by who you know, where you know them, and making new alignments. In this yes. digital age, and then where we have been, um, you know, more isolated, and those social interactions, IRL in real life have been pretty much eliminated. Are you still seeing this quote-unquote headhunting done digitally? 
Yeah, I think it's an interesting time right now because people are kind of starting to get back out there in person as the pandemic is, knock on wood, winding down a little bit. But um, I mean, it's always been a blend, I would say, for the last few years of virtual and in-person. And um, my personal hope is, you know, maybe some more in-person things will start happening because nonprofits are usually very community driven and local oriented. So sometimes it is important to have that in-person networking, but yeah, I mean, a, a good headhunter is well connected with, with VIPs in their industry and in their community. Um, you know, often a headhunter or a recruiter will have some candidates on standby that they know are looking for a job and they're just waiting for the right job to come available. So um, it's, it is really about who you know and being able to, to conjure up someone in your head as soon as you know of a job opportunity. You know, that's a valid point. And that's one that we've talked about on the show before is, you know, if someone's not necessarily looking for a move, but they are tapped on the shoulder, right? And I think that happens quite a bit in our sector. Are you seeing, Emily, that that is happening more frequently now or are you seeing that as still kind of standard standard process? It's not happening more or it's not happening less? Um, I think it's probably happening a little bit more because, more. you know, like we said, there's just a lot more jobs available right now. And a lot of hiring managers are or recruiters are having have to get creative to to find new people. So. Um, it's really all about effective messaging. So, you know, if you are looking for someone to join your organization, you might not want to start off by saying that if they are pretty happy in their current job, you don't know if they're happy or not, but you kind of have to assume that they are and kind of approach it initially as, hey, you know, I, I love the work you're doing and I'd love to talk to you more. And um, see if there's any work that we could potentially explore together. And maybe it does turn into, yeah, I'm really not interested in a move right now, but maybe there's an opportunity for your, your nonprofit organizations to collaborate. And that's, that's great too. So I think it's just, you know, phrasing it as let's have a conversation and see where it goes. Yeah. And what about the, the good old trick? I'm, I don't know. I'm going to call it a trick where we send, um, you know, a, a job description to someone that we would love to apply. We would love to attract this person. And we say, Hey, sending this over to you to see if you are, well, really to see if anyone, see if you know of anyone, right. But kind of planting that seed. <laughs> Hint, hint, wink, wink, like, right. <laughs> if you're interested, let me know, give me a call. Um, tell, let's just talk about that, right? Is that taboo? Should we be doing that? Is there a better way to do it? Um, it's like you said, it's kind of that good old trick where maybe it's <laughs> a little taboo, but um, I think it's, it is happening. And if you want to stay competitive, it's something you kind of need to do as well. And like you said, if you're phrasing it, do you know anyone who might be interested? Wink, wink. <laughs> um, that that opens the door without being too direct or directly poaching. I would say just, you know, of course, being cognizant of any relationships that are already existing and, and not burning any bridges between your organizations or people that have a connection to your organization and you wouldn't want to yeah. offend anybody or, or upset them. Well, and I, that's a valid point because I think we can all agree, no matter how large our nonprofit world seems, it's really quite small when you yeah. get down to the granular level, right? You really yeah. identify that we are a small community in this big global world. And, you know, seeing some of our viewers on today, I know that you know, we've got viewers on from Canada, we've got viewers on from all over and truth be told, it's a small network of us, you know, like there's, there's a small network in this really big economy. Um, so let's, I have yeah, a question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Jared, you said something and I want to ask Emily, because this just sparked a question, you know, for so long, we were taught or we, we structured our HR 
by defining what it was we needed in terms of a job description. And we tried to make it non-personal and just say, these are the tasks that we need. It seems to me that I'm now seeing a switch to these are the types of people we need and these are the talents we need. Mm -hmm. And then we'll plug them in to what, what we need to operate with. And I'm wondering if you're seeing that too, or if that's just my own observation. You no, know, you're absolutely right, Julia. I think um, it's, it's coming from that challenge of finding employees and employers really have to go back to the drawing board and think about what is absolutely necessary in this role? And, you know, when we're talking about executives, obviously a, a CEO, an executive director, a VP, they can't be brand new to the field um, or maybe they're brand new to nonprofits. I think that's something that uh, employers have, have had to be flexible on lately is, of course, the preference is usually someone who's coming from the industry, but if yeah. they have transferable experience you know, that might be, that might be what you need right now, or what you can find is the reality. So um, you are right, you know, it's, it's a lot more about the, your abilities and your potential, um, more so than uh, all of these hard requirements that it used to be. I find that fascinating, because, you know, that really, when I think about it, coming from the nonprofit academy, viewpoint or lens you know we have had a big push especially with women in the sector to navigate up on skill set so that they could then apply right mm -hmm. you know I need this certificate I need to extend my education I need this time served and um, so that you would look good on paper in essence right mm -hmm. and now it is it seems like it's swinging back to this personality driven point. And, and what you just said, I think is fascinating to be um, mm -hmm. aware of that. And I, I don't know, it, it, it just seems like it's going to really change structurally how we operate our nonprofits, because we're going to be coming in with, with now a more human centric approach. Mm -hmm. And, and those personalities are going to change or morph our nonprofits versus the tasks at hand. I don't know, Jared, if that's like too like, you know, woo woo, but if you, do you see that Jared? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think all of this is changing and I think we have a fantastic question from one of our viewers. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw it in now. And I know we want to talk about how the recruitment process works. So Emily, if this question kind of moves us into that conversation, um, that's fine too. But the, the viewer wants to know, are candidates now asking for different benefits, you know, perks are different work arrangements, even beyond this virtual space, more than before the pandemic? So how is that, you know, so recruiting is happening, um, but then also really looking at, you know, how is the negotiation happening? Yeah, I guess a couple of new things that are kind of emerging trends on the market right now is, like you said, the, the additional benefits or perks that might be not as common, you know, beyond your health insurance, beyond your PTO, um, things like pet insurance or ID theft protection, you know, those kind of things are part of benefits packages sometimes now. And of course, it depends on what the particular candidate is looking for, but those are just a couple things that come to mind beyond the what you would typically think of. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely, I think that as more employers offer more options in the benefits arena, mm -hmm. um, candidates are becoming more aware of that. And it's a competition, you know, you, you have to be prepared as a, a nonprofit leader to share and pitch even in a sales way, kind of what your benefits are and what's unique about them. Um, gone are the days where you just say, oh, this is the position, you know, here's the salary, here's the benefits, blah, 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 yada, yada. It's very boring and mundane. Like you really have to spice it up now and, and 
understand first what the candidate is really looking for and what their needs and priorities are. And then really kind of when you're making them an offer, it's a, a sales pitch of here's some of our benefits and the, the ones that might not be as common that, that you would get if you work here. Like pet insurance. What a great yeah. add on for people that, <laughs> you know, if that's something that's, that's important to them. And, and one thing we've learned during the great resonation is certainly the variety of importance for so many different people that has really, really come to the surface. Mm -hmm. Well, let's do move us into, I know we don't have too much time left, but let's talk about this recruitment process. And on your website, for those of you that might've checked out, checked out Emily's website, please do that. But you talk about this RPO. So how does the RPO work? And as I said, what the heck does RPO stand for? (laughs) Yeah. So can mean a couple things, but in this case, we're talking about recruitment process outsourcing. Um, so really what that means is again, kind of, kind of obvious, I guess, but it's a recruiter who can handle an outside recruiter who handles all of your recruitment functions from start to finish. So everything from posting the job to sourcing candidates and doing resume screens and then phone screens, usually They'll also coordinate with um, internal hiring managers to schedule the next interviews. Uh, So really kind of functioning like an in-house recruiter, but being an outside agency. Um, A couple of instances that I've seen employers need RPO is uh, a mid-sized organization. Usually if they have like a handful of roles on an ongoing basis, you know, maybe one or two a month, but they, they don't have a need for an in-house recruiter. They can't justify the salary. Um, maybe, maybe they do have one or two HR staff, but they're, you know, handling everything and, uh, it's a HR director. And so they're more focused on their culture and their benefits and all of those kinds of things. And they don't have the time to put towards, uh, the recruitment piece. So, Um, Those are a couple of kinds of employers that I've seen need recruitment process outsourcing. Um, And and then I guess to add on to that, you know, if it's a a long-term arrangement or a permanent arrangement, if they're hiring a company like mine to do recruitment process outsourcing, um, we can also help out with some of the more strategy related and process related items of recruitment. So what is your employer brand? You know, what are you putting out there on your job descriptions? Um, We talked about applicant tracking systems a little bit. How are you gathering your applicants? And what interview questions are your hiring managers asking? Those kinds of things are usually the responsibility of the organization, but with recruitment process outsourcing, that is something that I, as a recruitment agency, would be integrated in. Now, do you do that at all levels? I know today we're talking specifically that executive, the VP kind of level. Is this RPO, the recruitment process outsourcing standard process for every position? Good question. So I think it actually is not as relevant to executive and VP levels just because Mm -hmm you're not going to have as many of those, hopefully. (laughs) Um, But usually recruitment process outsourcing is more for your mid-level roles. Um, And, and, but yeah, the, the head hunting part that we kind of talked about earlier, that's an executive search. That is when you are looking for a leader within your nonprofit. Perfect. And I'm curious. I, I know I have all these questions, Julia, and you're like, I do too. No, me too. I have, I I'm next. Sure. Okay. You're next. you're next. We have, we have a viewer that asked another question too. We need to get in the queue. Um, are you seeing more Emily where there is, um, advancement from within, right? So maybe the population, is it coming in by way of uh, new applicants, but now's the time to really develop our workforce internally. Is that happening more now? Yes. And if it's not happening, um, it really should be because of course, to get to that executive level, it, it is a long progression. So they may not start at the very bottom of the chain, but I have worked with a few nonprofits that their current executive director started in, you know, 
2000 and they've worked their way up. They were a bookkeeper, a office manager, and now they're the ED. So that it, it's always great to see organizations that do that. And I think that to be competitive, like we talked about earlier, nonprofits need to make sure that they have intentional plans and strategies and workforce development, even succession planning, those kinds of things that are setting up their employees to advance within their careers. Great. Okay, Julia. Okay. Get yours in. Oh my God. I know. I'm like, I'm under the, I'm, I'm under pressure here. Cause I want to answer um, a question. Another question that came in that says, please give examples of personality driven job descriptions, which we were talking about um, a few moments ago. I'm thinking that this would be like the, the call for, um, you know, using words like you, you have empathy, you mm -hmm. are curious, you want to solve problems, or you're a good listener. I mean, things of that nature that kind of fill the cultural aspect of an organization versus you need to have two years of Chinese uh, studies or don't apply, right? right. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and so for me, that's kind of, that was part of my question is how, how far do we, to use Sheryl Sandberg's, you know, phraseology, lean in mm -hmm. on these jobs. Yeah, thank you. Lean in on these job descriptions, which we know actually shed off interested folks because they'll read one thing and they'll be like, oh yeah, I, I don't know that. Now, could they Especially learn women? And it's more women than men. I didn't want to be man basher because our executive producer is on with us today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but women will say, oh my gosh, you know, I only had two years of Chinese and, and it's saying they want three or, or, I mean, some like things like that, that are really um, cutting off resource, a, a source of potentially really strong labor for us. And so yeah. I'm just that my question to you and to answer this viewer's question was, you know, is it appropriate or can we write into the job descriptions maybe more nuanced personality oriented things. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring that up because I just got a question yesterday from a nonprofit CEO who was asking, you know, what are your thoughts on preferred versus required uh, qualifications? And is it true that sometimes preferred will deter people from applying? Yeah. Um, so the thing I told him that I would stand by is, um, I think that just like the shift to culture in an organization, you've got to start that from the very beginning. So your job posting should reflect that. I think that some job postings are still kind of old fashioned for lack of a better term. And um, there are ways to spice it up and make it more genuine and more reflective of your true culture without being, you know, cheesy. Like we've seen the the job titles that are way out there and don't really, they're not a, an actual job title. Like I'm not saying to do that, but to your point about um, integrating more of the personal component, you know, that starts with the, or not the personal, but the, the soft characteristics and personality traits. So uh, that starts with the job description and yes, thinking long and hard about what are your actual requirements to do the job well and then maybe cutting out some of the fluff, you know? This has been fascinating. Emily, I'm so thrilled that you would join us because um, this is just a, a, a discussion point that I, Jared, I don't know about you, but I feel like these things are being woven in to almost every, every guest we have on. I mean, well, it is, it's, it's relevant, you know, right? It's top yeah. current events. Absolutely. So Emily, this has been fantastic. We warned you our time went by quickly yes, and it, it does, is. um, but founder CEO, joyful jobs, joyfuljobs.org. Check out Emily's website. It is fantastic. Yeah, it is. And, Thank um, you. I know we will have more questions for you. So, um, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you both. It was great chatting. It's been wonderful. Hey, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors again, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, the nonprofit nerd herself, 
hello, Jared Ransom, Fundraising Academy, the Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leaders, and Staffing Boutique. As we end this day and we remind ourselves with this message all the time, stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thank you.